right, everyone. So this is a story about an issue that I uncovered after doing all that work on my brakes, uh, which is now a couple of years ago since I did that. I've put that work in a video on my channel. In this video here, I'm covering how I discovered this new problem, all the dramas I went through to resolve it. But funnily enough, in the end, the cause was so, so minor, I could have just ignored it and carried on with my life. But in any case, I'm pretty happy I went through all the work and all the troubleshooting. I got into tires, calipers, discs, hubs, wheels, pads, everything. Um, I actually did put up a video about getting new tires and that was during this affair as well. I did already post a long series of videos about the brake rebuilding. I think it's a three-parter. Prior to that, I also posted a long video showing the installation of the Racetech fork kit. And that was all done at the same time as the brakes. I basically spent a lot of time doing all of these jobs at once. And then when I was done, I discovered this problem. So the big surprise after doing all that work on the brake calipers was that I didn't even use them. I ended up finding and purchasing a perfect set of NOS Bremo PO8s with the exact pads that I wanted. And they were quite cheap and I thought about it for quite a while, I think is this silly, and I just went with it because that's what my bike looks like. It looks NOS. It doesn't look like a bunch of polished up old parts. It looks like it's a new bike. And I can, of course, sell the um, other calipers to someone who's doing up a bike and just wants something that's not necessarily, you know, brand new, but is fully reconditioned and looks great. As part of rebuilding the brakes, I purchased new bleed nipples. And in the video, I couldn't get them to fit very well. It was weird that when I'd screw them in to the caliper body, the hex nut part of them would just about rest on the body of the caliper when they were tightened down. And that was just weird. I couldn't quite figure out what was going on there. Eventually I figured out that the nipples that were on the bike before had been modified. They'd had a little bit of material taken off of that hex part to thin it out a little bit and provide a little bit more clear space between that and the body of the caliper. In addition to that, with the new calipers, I was finding it difficult to seal the brake hose banjos against the anodized finish of the calipers. And it just didn't seem right to me because the anodizing, of course, has a little bit of texture to it. And here I was trying to fasten with a copper washer, sort of a banjo on the end of a brake hose to that body, trying to seal it up against the caliper body. It was just too weird. And so I started looking at manuals and parts lists and photos, which I have thousands of. And eventually I realized that the front hose arrangement on my bike was not standard. I thought it was because it looked so good. Like I, I knew the earlier bikes had the, um, I guess it's a copper tubing or some sort of a tin tubing, you know, those, those brake tubes. I knew they had that on the earlier bikes, but I just assumed that with my bike, they changed it and, and put the uh, hoses straight onto the calipers. In any case, I sort of realized that the previous owner had taken them off and set it up like this. That's why the nipples didn't work, didn't fit right. That's why the banjos wouldn't seal against the body correctly. There was, a, there was another significant problem that I've had with my old brakes that I was certain that I would resolve with uh, rebuilding the brakes. And that was the constant grinding and the squeaking and the whole lot of brown brake dust that the front calipers produced the noise and the sort of grinding sound it's just horrible and I always thought that um, one of the pistons was sticking and just causing one of them to drag all the time and so that was part of the motiv motivation for doing this entire job in the first place I wanted I didn't know what the brakes were like and I thought I'd go through it and rebuild them set them all up on disassembly when I was pulling the brakes apart I found that it wasn't really the case the pistons came out perfectly, they weren't stuck, it seemed everything seemed to be in pretty good order. I thought the discs were looking a little bit rough, and I had the impression there was too much wear and tear going on. And of course that's what's creating all that brake dust, is all the wear and tear on the discs, obviously. Um, so when time came to research 
and choose some new brake pads for my rebuilt brakes, I figured out that the pads were sintered pads and not for use on cast iron discs. Not at all for use, because they do exactly what was happening. They chew up the discs really badly. Um, so this was just another failing by the previous owner who either rebuilt the brakes or oversaw the rebuilding of the brakes, or I don't know who did it, but um, in any case, wrong pads. Sintered pads are for steel discs, and they need that extra bite to get similar performance as, as cast iron discs. And so the pads that I decided to get, to get in the end were the Brembo Road Carbon Ceramic 08, uh, the product code 07BB14.08, same one front and rear. There's this chart at Brembo that shows the relative friction of the pads, but note that the colors don't match the colors of the pads themselves, the backing plates. So blue on the chart is red on the plate. So the, the centered pad is the red one, and that's actually the blue line on the chart, and so on. The swapping the pads instantly fixed the squealing and the grinding, and I don't get that kind of brake dust and anything like that. Now the brakes are like new, and they work really well. So, lesson learned, if you've bought a bike rebuilt by someone else, you just cannot trust that it's being put together properly. In any case, funnily enough, I actually recently rebuilt my old mountain bike, and that always had exactly the same issue with all the grinding and squealing on the front brakes. And I thought, well, maybe that's got the same problem. Even though I bought that bike in a box from the factory and I assembled it myself, so those are factory pads. But I researched the pads and it's exactly the same thing. I sourced some original plane pads and now the bicycle works perfectly and doesn't grate and squeal and everything. When I was doing the brakes, I also decided to pull off the discs and clean up the disc carriers and give them a little bit of a refinishing because they were pretty rough looking. There was rust from the cast iron of the discs because water gets in. If you have ever washed your bike, you're riding in the rain, the water gets in behind the disc. And so I uh, thought I'll pull it apart, clean it all out, give it a light spray again, make it all look real nice. I, in order to return the discs to the same hubs, to the same position on the hubs and the hubs, so the carriers and the carriers back onto the wheels in the same position, I used some colored zip ties for the discs and I used um, marks, made little pock marks in the surface of the hub where you couldn't see it. So what I was doing was doing all that so I could get everything back to where it was back to the position it was in because I made an assumption that everything was where it was supposed to be and my experience with this bike is that's just simply not the case. I put it back together how it was. I assumed that that was going to be right and that was the best I could do anyway. And so I finally got on the road for a bit of a longer ride to bed the new brake pads in and the pads were great right out of the box they just felt really good much nicer to use than the previous brakes a little bit softer on the on the lever um, completely silent and I do expect them to tighten up a little bit as they wear into the discs so during that ride near the end of the ride there's a long downhill slope on the motorway with an 80k speed limit and so I was just uh, coasting down there feathering the uh, front brake lever just very lightly because I'd noticed this sort of a fluttering feeling. I couldn't feel it in the lever, but I could feel it in the bike. On the way down, I kept trying to look around the bike to see what was happening. It was clear to me that it was something around the front wheel, something to do with the brakes, obviously. And it was also clear that the, um, the frequency of this fluttering matched the RPM of the wheel. Each single turn of the wheel would give you one beat in that fluttering. And so it had to be something to do with the brakes or the tires. Or as I was riding down, I even thought about the fork kit. I was thinking that maybe there's something is setting up a resonance. These are the kind of things I was trying to think about as I was going down the hill. And uh, in particular, there was no movement in the lever itself. Old discs like this, if you look at the surface of the disc, sometimes you'll see a section where there might be pitting or corrosion. And this often happens with an old bike with cast iron on brake discs, is if the bike was wet or if there was uh, you know, fluid coming through the pistons, so there's a bit of a leak going on, and if the bike sat for a number of years in one spot, um, you can get where that pad is touching the disc, you'll get corrosion on that spot. And so if you look around your disc, very often you'll see an area where it's like that, because of course you're having an uneven surface. You know, smooth and then it's a little bit less smooth and then it's smooth all the way around again 
However, they didn't do this before the brake rebuild, and so, so I sort of discounted that. I uh, considered whether the new pads were making any difference. I knew the pads I chose were the most suitable and the least likely to cause this kind of problem. I did know they needed to bed in. That was clear. I got home, I set up the bike, I checked the alignment of the calipers to the discs. Um, this is, you know, getting the disc right in the middle of the calipers so that the uh, pads on either side are in the same position relative to the caliper. Now you've got a bit of play in there. It can go a couple of millimeters one way or the other and the caliper, you know, being a dual dual piston thing makes up for that. Uh, but still it was a bit tight on one side and so I used spacers to um, set that up again. I took it on a quick ride after that and the problem was exactly the same. My next job back in the workshop was to check the discs on the bike for run out and also measure the thickness. Um, the run out was a bit fiddly to measure. Uh, I ended up clamping using a sort of vice grips to clamp a dial indicator to the to the wheel nut and then I could spin the tire I lifted up the front of the bike with my hoist and I spun the wheel and uh, tried to find a position on the disc where I could try and observe run out it wasn't that great well, it wasn't a great way to measure it but um, I couldn't see anything terribly wrong and in order to check the thickness I just used a micrometer and went around with the with again with the wheel mounted just tried to go around and measure different areas if your discs are worn unevenly, with some sections thinner than other sections, then you can possibly detect that in the lever when you brake, because the lever will move in and out as the brake pads move together and further apart as they go around the thick and thin section of, of the disc. But if the disc is, is warped and produces run out from warping, it doesn't do that. Um, regarding the wear, the parallelism of the discs. The left disc was 6.2 to 6.25 millimeters, uh, so that's five one hundredths of a millimeter, so nothing terrible there. And so runout has to be kept low. And so eventually I found a page in one of Falloon's books here with a paragraph on brakes, and this proved very useful. Road is a cast iron, thickness of 6.5 millimeters, so mine at 6.2 to 2.7 roughly are fine. He says here yeah, the minimum thickness is 5.8. Um, they're not too worn down. Um, lateral disc run out, this is the one that mattered, 0.2. So 20 one hundredths of a millimeter. So that was good to know. I also found uh, somewhere online I saw something about 70s Harley discs and it said 0.2 to 0.3 so 20 to 30 one hundredths which sort of agrees with this so uh, aiming for 0.2 max is seems fine the parallelism of the disc to hub surface five one hundredths 0.05 millimeters some of those discs have the carrier sort of cast into the disc mine of course has the aluminum carrier but either way five one hundredths from the disc to the hub Total is not clear unless they're saying 25 hundredths total. Well, that would actually fit with the Harley data, 20 to 30. So 25 total max run out here would actually fit that as well. So in any case, I actually had some numbers to go by. Um, that one disc radial error, about four one hundredths. That's referring to the disc not spinning dead center. So as it spins around, it goes off in a little bit of an orbit by four one hundredths. So in any case, with that, I had some numbers to go by. We're looking at up to 25 one hundredths maximum. I was already below that right out of the box, and I decided I could probably improve on that quite a lot. I measured run out at 0.15 to 0.2, seemingly well within that range. And so not really a problem. So, I did consider whether one can get discs like this refinished. I did actually find a place uh, in the States somewhere that has some kind of a setup, and it looks like they're basically using angle grinder in, in set up in this machine, and it's got a diamond grinding disc, and they've got it set up so it can just swing across a surface, and they put a disc on it on the surface, and they start swinging this thing across, and they can um, take off a tiny, tiny amount. It actually looked pretty good. I didn't think it was an option for me because my discs didn't seem to be bad, but it was interesting to find out that that was something one could do at a pinch. 
So I also had to look around for, you know, can you get a brand new disc? Because I'd seen them around on the various sites. And you can buy a really nice looking set of stainless discs that are replicas of the cast irons, but they're stainless steel. And those would have to use sintered pads. They look nice. They're really nicely made, but they're too shiny, I think, for the bike. I like the look of the old cast iron discs. They've got that kind of a gray cast iron look to them, which is quite nice. So I did also have a look around for secondhand discs, but they basically always heavily worn out. And I wasn't really looking for another disc because I thought my discs seemed to be pretty good. I always planned to get new tires, and so I thought, well, let's do that first. Spend a lot of time researching tires, and there's another video on my channel going into that. I talk about all the different options available, and then um, with a chap I know here, we put them on and uh, get into that drama. And I ended up with the same tires as the previous owner bought. And this was one choice he made that was good. And those are the Metzler Laser Tech, really nice tire, modern silicon compound front and rear. And in my opinion, they look period for the early 80s, which is the spike. So I got those, took it for a ride, and no, everything was exactly the same. Although the, the new tires were really nice to ride, and uh, that was definitely well worth it. So at this point, it was still happening basically exactly the same. I negated the fork, the tires, the run out and the discs, I didn't think there was any problem. So I decided to set about trying to reduce run out as much as possible. If you're ever doing your tires, your sorry, your discs, you've got to get these Schnorr washers, S-C-H-N-O-R-R, -R, I think it is Schnorr. And those are those funny little, um, I mean, they're not a star washer, they're actually cup shaped and they have lots of little edges and they're quite hard and they're made to be used once. And I got fresh um, steel disc carrier bolts or screws, fresh fasteners also for the discs and hubs. Again, took a bit of effort because the washers, for example, holding the carrier to the hub, they've got a quite a bit larger outer diameter than a typical washer. So I got all those parts together and then set about pulling the discs and the carriers off the wheels. So I checked the um, carriers carefully, and then I checked the hubs for run out. So whilst the carriers were still on the hubs, I checked those. The hubs were actually really good. There was very, very little run out, I think two or three hundredths. The carriers, of course, are painted, and I knew that I had given them a light spray twice in the, what, six or seven years that I've had it now. Obviously, the previous owner, and possibly even the one prior to that, had done the same thing. And so I was thinking, well, you know, there's paint all over them. That certainly adds up. You can definitely get a few hundred mil, a few one hundredths with paint. Something else I'd noticed on my front discs was that where those tabs are, where the screws hold the disc to the carrier, I always noticed that it gave the appearance that the screws were tightening down those tabs and distorting them slightly as they were being tightened down. Because I could see this kind of a, either a wear or just a discoloration kind of a pattern around the area of each screw. If you imagine that the disc was not made of um, cast iron, but was made of something a little bit flexible, and that screwing the screwing it up super tight onto the carrier would distort the material a bit. It was like that. And so I was considering how that would even happen. And I decided that through repeated resprays of the carriers, it's not just the fact you're respraying it, but it's the fact that we you're spraying into a corner. See the, the carrier has the flat surface that the disc attaches to, but it's also got the corner and that sticks up at least six or seven millimeters or more. And so when you're spraying with a bottle sprayer or whatever, and you're spraying into a corner, into a 90 degree corner, anyone who's done this, you know that it's impossible to get the spray into the corner. If this had been done multiple times, I think you could easily add two or three or four hundredths to the outer edge and far less to the inner edge. So what I'm getting at is that the surface that the disc sits up against is not flat. It's actually raised on the outer edge and then as you go towards the center, it's not as raised. It's more like it was when it was new. 
And so I went off to a random engineering firm. This guy came wandering out and he went, oh, that's a Brembo P08. He races bikes, his son races bike, had a garage full of bikes. He also had quite a sizable lathe in his garage. And so I took these carriers to him and I asked if he could spin them down just very slightly to make them parallel front to rear, take the paint off. And I asked him, as he spun them down, could he see what I thought the problem was? So the paint would be coming off unevenly, like around the outside first, and he said it was. Um, he had had a go at setting them up by offsetting the carriers to the hubs to get it in the best position. And that was good, but I was going to do it again anyway. So once I got them home, I pulled it all to pieces and set about doing it myself. You know, the idea is to try the carriers on both sides and in every possible position to find out which carrier is best on which side in what position uh, to get the least amount of run out on the carriers. And so I also cleaned up the hubs as you can see here. But I took off as much of the um, sealant, Loctite, all kinds of crap. So I used a blade just to scrape that without taking off any metal. And then set about lining up these carriers. And that took a long time. And the outcome of that was on one side, the runout of the hub itself gave me three one hundredths on one side left and four one hundredths on the other side. So that was my starting position, three and four one hundredths. Then the plan was to use the carriers to counter that. Now, if the carriers had been absolutely perfect, well, I would have ended up with three and four one hundredths again. But of course, I knew they wouldn't be. They'd be nearly perfect. So when I finished that job, I ended up with on the right side, three one hundredths. So it was down one one hundredth, but it had the carrier attached now. So I actually managed to lose a hundredth and get it down to three one hundredths with the carrier attached. And because I knew the original positions of all these things, that one was actually 180 degrees offset from its original position, which had 12 one hundredths run out. So that was a big, big improvement. These are small numbers, though. Once this was all fastened with all the new fasteners, it, e it reduced even more to one one hundredth. So my carrier was one one hundredth on the right side. So that was very successful. On the other side, I had 0.4 and the carrier was offset by one bolt from its original position. But in final assembly, with everything tightened up and torqued down, also one one hundredth. So both sides, I had one one hundredth a run out. On the carriers. So I'm very, very happy with that, but it was hard work to do that. I'm not suggesting anyone should do this. I'm doing this because I want to do it and I like to do things as best I can. I should point out that these discs were cleaned and then placed in evaporust, which I've done twice. I did it um, way back and then I did it again this time. And I like the evaporust, it's really nice. The finish you get is that nice gray cast iron look. It almost looks like a new disc. You do have to scrub it as it comes out of the evaporust. You scrub it and it removes this kind of a gray stuff. So getting these discs into their best orientation on the carriers, this was a drama. At first I was trying to tighten it up, you know, in three positions and then add three more. And it was very difficult. It was so hard to do. And when I'm tightening up, I'm not torquing it up. I'm just tweaking it up to where it's, you know, holding. Eventually I realized that I could actually just put the disc on, hold it, spin it, take records, hold it again, spin it a little bit, swap it over to the other side, you know. And I did that over and over again to, f to find the best overall result. And the outcome of that was also excellent. The measurements were the right disc assembled, meaning torqued up with all the new bolts, new steel bolts and the sh new Schnorr washers. I had five one hundredths on the inside of the disc and seven one hundredths on the outside. By inner and outer, I mean the inner is just to the inside of those holes and the outer was just to the outside of those holes. But I also did measurements on the next part in. It was hard because you keep hitting the holes with your dials and so on. In the areas where I kept testing it, five one hundredths inside, seven one hundredths outside. Then the other side assembled, I had six one hundredths and eight one hundredths then on the outside, so one one hundredths more. And so the discs at this point were adding between four 
and seven one hundredths. Now interestingly enough at this point the discs are in fact swapped left and right. You know the best one on the left side is the one that used to be on the right side and vice versa. Something for whoever buys the spike in future. I do have on the right side there's a single dimple on the inside of the carrier and there's a matching single dot on the hub itself. And on the other side, the left side has two dimples. As for the discs, there's no markings on the discs, so if you're pulling it apart, you just use zip ties. Um, afterwards, by the way, I did actually check the rear disc as well, because I didn't have any trouble with the rear disc, and I wasn't too worried about it. I checked it anyhow, and it was an excellent order, no issues at all. So the rear disc hub run out was two one hundredths on the inner edge, oh, and three one hundredths on the outer edge. The carrier inner edge was four hundredths, the outer was five hundredths, so it was, everything was adding a hundredth. And with the disc on, the best position, the inside was five hundredths and the outside was five hundredths. So the total run out was five hundredths after lining it all up, but not doing any other particular work. And the worst run out before that on the rear was fifteen one hundredths. So again, nothing. I did already know that these values of 15 to 20 hundredths were not supposed to be sufficient to cause any trouble. The disc thickness on the rear was 6.27 all the way around. So put it all back together. Very happy with the run out and everything. It was great. Uh, and of course I did refinish it. The carriers, and I did, I put a very, very even thin coat of the same caliper spray that I always use. All right, so with all that put back together, I went out for a ride, and the problem still happened, exactly the same, no change. By this time, I had already sort of decided that the problem was due to the evapor rust that was still visible on the uh, discs. It's not that easy to see in the photos. There was an unevenness in the way that the evapor rust coating was coming off, like there was more of it on the outside of the disc for a third of the circumference of the disc and then on another part of the disc it was different. It was simply causing the pad to slip a tiny bit. And so I just uh, ignored it. And a couple of rides later, it was all gone. So it was interesting to do all the work. So I've got the brakes and the hubs and the carriers and the discs and the pads and the calipers and the tires. All of these things are now perfect. I'm very happy with that. And we're at the end of this one. So uh, thank you for sticking through this and uh, do the likes and the subscribes and the comment. All right. Thanks. Bye-bye. Okay.